Y'all remember that TV show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Ain't that the stupidest question you ever heard in your life? All the people I know that don't want to be millionaires or multimillionaires or billionaires because for them it would be a step downward. For the rest of us, people like me, I would love to be a millionaire. I, I have spoken several times to the Lord and tried to convince him he could trust me <laughs> to handle those wealth, of wealth properly, but so far he has not seen fit to do so. I remember one night Gladys and I were watching that show and uh, one of the contestants, he got stumped on a question that he had. And so he phoned a friend, and the friend led him in the right direction, and he answered that question correctly. A little while later, he got stumped again, and he said, I wish I had another phone a friend. Can you imagine having a friend that you could call that always had the right answer at the right time, who knew everything and was always available? And my friend, I want you to know that there is such a person and there is such a friend that you can call at any time. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning and turn with me, please, to the book of John. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse 1. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. There Jesus says, I assure you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the door but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens it for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought all of his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger Instead, they will run away from him because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. And Jesus gave them this illustration, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Now, if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, and I do, and if you believe that every word in the Bible is true, and I do, then it's very clear in this passage that Jesus says his followers will be able to hear his voice. It is also very clear in this passage that Jesus says his followers will be able to recognize his voice. Now there were times growing up I didn't exactly want to hear my dad's voice. I thought he might want to cause me to head in a direction other than I had intended. There were times I did not want to hear him, but I could. And in this passage, Jesus says, if you are a follower of mine, you will be able to hear my voice. Now, why in the world would we want to hear Jesus' voice in the first place? I mean, after all, isn't God a, some kind of a, a cosmic killjoy trying to keep us from having fun and trying to keep us from doing what we want? And won't God get in the way of our plans and our, our aspirations? The things that we want to achieve and accomplish in life, why in the world would we want to hear God's voice in the first place? I believe there are several reasons from Scripture why we would want to hear God's voice in the first place. Number one, I want to hear God's voice because He knows everything. There is no question that I can take to Him, no problem I can be, bring before Him that God does not know or understand. Psalm 147 verse 5 says, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. How in the world would you like to have a friend like that? When you could call, who you know would know the answer regardless of what he, you asked him. God is like that. He is all-knowing. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How long has God been around? He's been around forever, from the very beginning. There is nothing that he has not seen. There is nothing that he is unaware of. God knows everything. Not only does God know everything, and not only has he been around forever, but God has been and is everywhere right now. Listen to what David says in Psalm 139, beginning in verse 7. He says, Where can I go from thy spirit? Or where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. 
If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to thee and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. God has always been around. He has been and currently is everywhere. There is no place you can go where God cannot hear you, where He is not present. Why should you and I want to hear God? Why in the world should we want to listen? Because God knows everything. But not only does God know everything, but God is also the creator of everything. The story is told of a man who was driving down the road when his car broke down. He pulled over the side of the road and lifted the hood and started fiddling underneath it. Now, I don't know exactly why he did that. Now, in this particular instance, the gentleman was quite knowledgeable about automotive stuff. Me, if my car breaks down, I pull to the side of the road, I open the hood and stick my head underneath there. Not because I know what I'm looking at. Not because I will recognize what the problem is, but because in the manual, all of those men are given at birth, it says when the car breaks down, you stick your head under the hood and pretend for your wife that you know what you were doing. <laughs> Gentleman's car broke down. He pulled it over the side of the road. He lifted the hood, stuck his head underneath there, and began working on it. And this man was knowledgeable. And he worked and he tightened this and twisted that and pulled this and, and checked to make sure that this was secure and he couldn't get it started. After a little while, uh, another man pulled up, saw him broke down on the side of the road, pulled over beside, and he walked up to the front of the car and the man said, I've tried everything in the world. I don't think you're going to be able to do anything for it. He said, give me just a minute. He stuck his head under the hood of the car. He tinkered for just a minute. He said, okay, now crank it up. The man went, he turned the key and it cranked right up. He said, man, how in the world did you start it so quickly? He said, my name is Henry Ford. I designed this car. If anybody knows how to make it work, then it is me. And what is true of the manufacturer and inventor creator of the automobile is also true of our Heavenly Father, for He is the creator and the inventor of all things. He is the creator of work. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, we read, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. God put Adam in the garden to work. Now, if God invented work, then he ought to know how it's supposed to go. He knows how to help you get accomplished the things that you need to get done. He knows how to help you set priorities. If you're having problems at work, if you're not sure what needs to be done, if you're not sure which priorities, what things need to come first, then you need to ask God. Because he is the creator, designer, and inventor of work. He understands how it happens. But not only is he the creator of work, he is also the creator and inventor of marriage. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 we read, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. My friend, God invented marriage. He knows how it's supposed to work. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Psalm 127 verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. If you're having trouble in your marriage, if you're having trouble in your home, then you need to hear a word from God. Because God knows how it's supposed to work. He knows what the problem is in the situation. You need to check with Him. God invented work. He invented marriage and He also invented friends. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 24 says, A man of many friends comes to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. God has an awful lot to say about friendship, about how to be a friend, about how to keep friends, and about how friends are supposed to help one another. God has a great deal to say about how you and I are supposed to be friends with other people and how we are supposed to guard ourselves from unfaithful and distracting friends. If you're having trouble with your friends or you don't have any or whatever, you need to hear a word from God. Because he is the one who created the whole thing. God invented work. He invented marriage. He invented friends. He invented in-laws and children and everything else. Whatever you're having problems with, you need to hear from God. Because he's got it covered. You and I need to hear from God because he's all-knowing. We need to hear from God because he is the creator of all things. 
And we need to hear from God because of what He wants to do. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I give eternal life to them. And again in John 3.16, we read, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. My friends, it is your, for your benefit and it is for my benefit that we listen to God because God wants us to have eternal life. He wants the very best for us. He wants us to have an eternal, forever, everlasting relationship with Him. It's to our advantage because God wants to give us eternal life. It's to our advantage to hear God because He wants to bless us. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 we read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. My friends, God is not some kind of cosmic killjoy. He doesn't want to keep you from having a good time. He wants to bless you. He wants what's best for you. Just as your parents want what's best for your children. God wants to bless you. You need to hear from God. Because even when we have to go through trials, God wants us to have a joy-filled life. John chapter 10, verse 10. Look there if you will. Jesus says, A thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it in abundance. Man, God doesn't want you to just drag through life. Looking forward to the day that it'll end. Looking forward to the day when it will all be over with. God wants you to live life with enthusiasm and gusto and joy. Accomplishing the, the task that He has prepared beforehand for you to accomplish. He wants you to live life with purpose and with meaning, with a mission, with a task. Jesus said, that's one of the reasons I came. That they might have life and that they might have it in abundance. In fullness. With joy. Man, you see some Christian going around like a sad sack with their face sad all the time, complaining about how bad things are all the time. Let me tell you, my friends, they're not doing it right. Paul and Silas, even in the prison after being beaten, were able to sing with joy because of the relationship they had with God. We need to hear from God because He wants to give us abundant life. We need to hear from God because He is all-knowing. He is the creator of all things because He wants what is best for you. But if there is someone around who knows everything and who only wants the best for me, then I want to hear him when he speaks. It is possible for you and I to hear God when he speaks to us. And I'm not talking about audibly, at least not all the time. But God can speak to us and prompt us in a number of different ways. God speaks in spite of the fact that the Bible says we can hear God when He speaks. It's still difficult sometimes to recognize God's voice when He speaks. Sometimes it's tough to make sure that his, it's His voice that we're hearing. Am I the only one who's ever struggled trying to recognize God's voice or trying to know what His will was? I mean, there are times when I have wrestled with God, is that you telling me to do this? God, is that really you speaking? John chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus says, I assure you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the door but climbs in from some other way as a thief and a robber, the one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens it for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. I remember a number of times when Drew was young, we would take him to places where there were crowds of people. Take him to a ball game or take him to a mall. 
And it is very important in those crowded situations that we're able to recognize his voice as he calls and he's able to recognize us. And what is true of us and our earthly children is also true of us and our Heavenly Father. It is very important. It is vital that we recognize our Heavenly Father's voice. And there are usually all kinds of conflicting voices going on in our mind. There's that voice that tells us what we want to hear. That tells us whatever we, to do whatever we want. Then there are the memories of what friends and family tell us. You know, mama or daddy who always has an opinion about what we should do. Sometimes they know what they're talking about and sometimes they don't. And sometimes there's not even a clear-cut right or wrong. There's just a choice between two alternatives. What do we do in those cases? Verse 4. Jesus says, My sheep recognize my voice when God speaks to us we will recognize his voice we will be able to distinguish it from the background noise we'll be able to tell that it's him that's speaking to us now how do we recognize God's voice when he speaks I believe that there are several items we can look for in determining whether it's God that's speaking to us. Look there again, if you will, please, verse 2. Jesus said, the one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Number one, when God is speaking, he comes in through the gate. Verse 1 says, thieves come in other ways, but the shepherd comes in through the gate. Now, what in the world does that mean? It means that when God speaks, he does so clearly. I don't know about you, but there are times when instead of listening for the Lord's voice clearly, I have allowed my emotions to lead me. I've allowed my love or my passion to lead me. Man, we can get so distracted when we do that. We have to struggle to make sure that what we're listening to is not a voice, not something coming in from a, another way, from a side door or over the wall. But it is the Lord himself speaking to us. I remember shortly after I attended, began attending seminary, about six months or a year after I'd started, a Home Depot and Lowe's uh, decided each to open a store across the street from each other there on Lake Mary Boulevard in Sanford, and they started fighting it out. And one of the casualties of that battle was our lumberyard and hardware store in Sanford. Uh, my parents ended up closing it. Now, I want you to understand, I grew up in that lumberyard. I worked there while I was in high school, worked there in junior high. I worked there after I'd finished college and come home. I, I worked there until the Lord called me to go to seminary. And it was hard knowing that my parents were having to ride that business down by themselves without me here to help. I remember one visit home from seminary. And my dad had started working as a deputy sheriff. My mom was having to oversee the business most of the time. She was discouraged and she was down and I sure wanted to stay and help her. It is in situations like that when our emotions and our feelings can, can try to drown out what we know God has called us to do. You see, my friends, when God speaks, He speaks clearly. Number two, I want you to understand when God speaks, He leads. Jesus says here in these verses, My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. See that they follow where Jesus is leading. Now God leads when he has something for you to do. The devil, the enemy on the other hand, he doesn't lead, he drives. And he does that in three primary ways. First, the devil threatens and intimidates. When Jesus is speaking, he'll tell you to do this or to do that. He'll lead, he'll tell you which way to go and what choice to make. The devil, when he speaks, will threaten or try to scare you. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. If anyone hears and opens, 
Jesus didn't force his way into your life in the first place and he's not going to try to use scare tactics to get you to do what he wants you to do and go where he wants you to go. He didn't beat down the door to get into your life and he's not going to do so to overwhelm your life now. The devil on the other hand when he's trying to get you to do something will present all of the perceived bad that will happen if you don't do what he wants. But not only does the devil threaten and intimidate but when he speaks he also orders. Jesus calls. He says come follow me. When he spoke to the disciples, he said, come follow me. When he spoke to the fishermen, he said, come follow me. When he spoke to Matthew at the tax collector's booth, he said, come follow me. The devil threatens and intimidates. He pressures. And also when the devil is trying to lead you, he will tell you it's urgent. There are no emergency sessions in heaven. There are no emergency counts councils in heaven whatever is going on in your life whatever situation you're having to make a decision about did not come as a surprise to God he knew about it beforehand and God will take his time and he will call you and he will lead you the devil on the other hand will press you and tell you it's urgent you ever wonder why so many sales people tell you you need to get in on this deal or that one before it's gone could it be because they're trying to sell you something or push you to get something that you don't need or that's not in God's will? And they want you to hurry up and make a decision before you have an opportunity to pray about it? God doesn't operate like that. I remember a number of years ago, I and another pastor from the association, we went to this business conference down in Orlando put on by Business Week. They had all the, the big league Top Gun speakers from around the country come in and speak. And in the midst of that program, they wanted to, to sell us this program to uh, um, help us invest in stock. My word, if you bought this program from Business Week, you would be instantly wealthy. They would tell you when to buy stock and when to sell stock. If you look for this and look for that, there's no way you could lose. But guess what? You can only do it for the next two hours. Mm. Man, I wish I had that money back. Why did they tell us we only had two hours? Because they wanted to rush us and press us. The Lord doesn't work that way. The, word, the Lord calls and the Lord leads. And third, when the Lord is speaking, He is relevant. Look there, if you will, with me, please, in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Did you notice in this verse what God said his name is? He said, I am. Helen Malachot once wrote a poem about God's name. She said, I was regretting the past, fearing the future. Then suddenly, my Lord was speaking. My name is I am. He paused. I waited. He continued. When you live in the past with its mistakes and regrets, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not. I was. When you live in the future with its problems and fears, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not. I will be. When you live in this moment, it is not hard. I am here. My name is I am. My friends, we serve the great God I am. That means when God speaks, it will be relevant to today. If you live with continual regrets about the past, if you are continually convicted about mistakes you have made, 
if you have asked God to forgive you of that stuff, then it's not Him talking to you. Leave it in the past. God's already buried it in the sea. He's already put it behind His back. That's the devil speaking to you. If you're continually worried about the future, then it's not God speaking to you about that. If there's nothing you can do right now to prepare for what's coming, then leave it alone. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34, Do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When God speaks, what He says to you will be relevant for today. He will talk to you about things in the here and now, not drag up the past or cause you to worry about the future. When God speaks, it's relevant. When God speaks, it never contradicts Scripture. When He speaks, He will never go against what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 12 verse 25, Jesus says, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself shall not stand. I've had people tell me they believe the Lord was leading them to do this or to do that. When what they were doing and what they were suggesting was clearly against what the Bible says. I've had people tell me, well, I've prayed about it and I believe the Lord's leading me to do this. Well, my friends, Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. When God tells you to do something, it will never contradict Scripture. It will never go against the Word of God. Fifth, when God speaks... He answers yes, no, or wait. James says, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no. When God speaks, He won't try to go through your reasoning process. When God speaks, He won't try to present an argument. My parents never tried to present an argument when they told me something when I was growing up. Daddy said, do it, and that was the end of the discussion. Now, occasionally, after I had done what he told me to do, I would go back and ask, or occasionally he would enlighten me as to why he had told me to do that. But at that time and at that moment, we did not go through a reasoning process or a discussion. God said, do it, and that was the end of the discussion. And when God speaks, that is the end of the discussion. He doesn't try to present an argument. He doesn't try to give you a certain number of facts and tell you to put them on the scale of your mind and weigh them against other options to decide what you think will be best for you. When God speaks, He simply says, this is what you need to do or this is what you need to quit. If you're sitting around trying to reason things out, then you're probably just trying to figure things out for yourself and hoping God will bless whatever decision, whatever conclusion you have come to. God says, if you want my blessing... If you want to stay in my will, then this is what you need to do. Six, when God is speaking to you, he brings encouragement. Look, if you will, please, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Look, if God is speaking to you, and it is your goal and desire to know His will and to act on it, then when you hear His voice, when you follow His direction, it will bring comfort. It will also bring peace. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Look there with me if you will please. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
And the peace of God which surpasses every thought will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Oh, I remember when the Lord called us here to start this church. I didn't really want to come. The whole time I'd been gone from Florida, all I wanted to do was get back to Florida. I was about to freeze in North Mississippi. Now those of you from further up north may not understand that, but I'm not accustomed to cattle troughs freezing over in the winter time. I'm not accustomed to seeing white stuff all over the ground. I didn't care for it one bit. I didn't care for the overcast skies. With the plowed under fields all winter, I found it discouraging and I wanted to come home until my second year in Mississippi. And then the Lord began to work. I fell in love with the people and I fell in love with where I was. I learned something a long time ago. You can be anywhere in the world and if you're not in God's will, you'll not be happy. But you can go anywhere in the world and if you're where God wants you, you will find a peace. We believed perhaps the Lord was calling us to come back to Florida. Didn't want to come. The church was growing there. We had a, a good young adults ministry. We had a number of families joining the church. I was raising cows and having a ball. And the Lord called us to come back to Florida. And we struggled with it and we wrestled with it and said, Lord, is this really what you want? Are you sure this is what you want? Gladys and I discussed it and I said, baby, I'm convinced this is what the Lord wants us to do. I don't know that she was convinced, but she was convinced that I was convinced. And she said, I'll go with you. We made that decision and you know the next morning, I've told you all the story. Of the lady that called said, Brother Gene, I've never done this before. I've never made a phone call like this before. I'd only seen the lady about six or eight times. She'd only visited our church about three times. But she said, this morning the Lord told me to call you and tell you that what you're going to do, He's going to bless you. I said, really? She said, I asked the Lord if there's a verse that He wanted me to share with you. And He said that there was. He told me to tell you, call upon me, saith the Lord, and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. When the Lord calls you to something, when you obey and have decided in your heart, yes, Lord, I will do what you tell me, you can be certain that it was He speaking to you because He will bring you a peace beyond your imagination my friend you can flounder and try to figure things out for yourself you can try to make the best decision you know how and hope things will work out or you can listen to God's voice you can listen to his direction you can say Lord wherever you lead I'll go Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. And you can as well. 